This Guide to the Perplexed, written by Wouter J. Hanegra, published just one year after the release of his more detailed and complex Esotericism and the Academy, 2012, constitutes a simplified narrative concerning the historiographical trends underpinning the construction of Western esotericism for a lay audience. Hanegraaff makes no delay in laying out his purported aims. Quote, We will be concentrating precisely on those worldviews, practices, and ways of knowing that have not succeeded in being dominant and have therefore been marginalized as rejected knowledge since the Enlightenment. End quote. Western esotericism, for Hanegraaff then, is not a reified tradition which can be defined, but rather a negatively constructed label designating a loose set of phenomena which share in common only the historical fact of having been rejected by the religious and intellectual mainstream. This is a unique way of conceiving what constitutes Western esotericism, as opposed to the efforts of earlier scholars like Antoine Favre, who sought to circumscribe it, that is, to come up with a list of defining features and slot such phenomena under the label of Western esotericism according to whether or not they share in some or more of these features. In any case, Honograph admits it's, quote, a modern scholarly construct, not an autonomous tradition, end quote. But it is one whose constituent parts, the academy, should neither treat as if they did not exist, or worse, treat as if they should not exist. Honograph gives due justice to the three most common models for understanding Western esotericism by elaborating on each of these approaches. One, as an alternative to the disenchanted worldview. Two, through the various occult currents which emerged in reaction to the Enlightenment, so uh, Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, Theosophy, Spiritualism, the New Age, etc., and three, through the ahistorical religionist lens of a universal inner spiritual tradition or gnosis, which spans across the whole of history and across numerous religions and worldviews. For Honograph, Western esotericism was the chief casualty of the process of academic specialization beginning in the 18th century. Part of maintaining the appearance of being learned in a post-Enlightenment world required signaling one's distaste for the old ways of thinking, and not even dignifying such subjects as worthy of debate, thus creating an academic dustbin of rejected knowledge. A dustbin for which certain definitive characteristics emerged, and which would have a decisive role to play in Western culture, despite its marginal status. Since this libellus is labeled a guide to the perplex, that is presumably written for students, it seems strange to me for Honograph to begin his work with a complex discussion about definitions and historiography. Uh, though this works well for someone with some familiarity in the field, it may be overwhelming for the uninitiated. Uh, perhaps the book might better have begun with some particular illustrative example of an event in history demonstrating how certain forms of knowledge, like alchemy, astrology, ritual, magic, so forth, how these were being gradually rejected, thus impressing newcomers with a sense of what is about to be discussed before jumping into some of its more complex methodological issues. Now, this is a minor quibble, but I believe accessibility to be an important factor in a book which avows itself to be a guide for beginners in the field. Now, Hanegraaff runs through a brief history of Western esotericism beginning with his concept of 
Platonic Orientalism as the ground for later developments such as Gnosticism and Hermeticism. In the Latin West, much of this knowledge died out during the early Middle Ages, but it was reintroduced into Europe through Muslim Spain starting from the late 11th century onwards. This knowledge largely took the form of texts on magic, uh, astrology, alchemy, uh, astronomy, these sorts of things. And in receiving these, Latin thinkers like Albertus Magnus, Roger Bacon, and Thomas Aquinas bifurcated magic into two broad categories, natural and demonic magic. Natural magic divorced of its theological content, went on to feed into the evolution of early modern science, while conceptions of demonic magic went on to fuel the paranoia that instigated the witch craze. Now, one critical aspect of magia naturalis was the study of hidden qualities or occult forces. And these, for example, were sought out through experiments with objects like amulets and astrological talismans, the kind demonstrated in works like the Picatrix. As centuries passed, and the study of experimental methods which had initially been born out of such magical pursuits were taken up by the theoreticians of early modern physics and chemistry, or quote-unquote natural philosophy. Here in the 17th century, beginning with the Rosicrucian texts, Western esotericists put on a definitive initiatic character, borrowing elements from the medieval stonemasons' guilds, the Knights Templars, Sufi orders, and Pythagorean or other mystery schools, and this led to such Enlightenment-era secret societies as Adam Weishaupt's Bavarian Illuminati or the Freemasons, for example. Much of the modern occult grew out of a sense of dissatisfaction with the newfound materialism of Enlightenment science. Consequently, Hanegraaff focuses on two Enlightenment-era natural philosophers turned mystics, Swedenborg and Mesmer who, although they went far in their physicalist researches, eventually became disillusioned with what they perceived to be materialism's narrow focus, uh, turning inward toward spiritualist concerns. These included astral travel and conversations with angels in the case of Swedenborg, or somnambulistic trances, and the development of new thought in the case of Mesmer, which would ultimately inform that mind over matter of Mary Baker Eddy's Christian science or the so-called hermeticism of the 20th century as espoused by such texts as the Kibalion. In more professionalized scientific circles, these occult pursuits would eventually be stripped of their more ostensibly mystical aspects to become one of the more well-known clinical practices of psychoanalysis in the first half of the 20th century. Incidentally, in reaction to this early science of psychology, alongside social science concepts like Marxist science, uh, this is also where the definition between science and pseudoscience was conceived with questions of falsifiability versus non-falsifiability becoming the determining factor. And this really furthered the divide between academic science and esoteric mysticism. The fruit of this 20th century bifurcation we could call the beginning of the New Age, which grew out from the belief that materialism was flawed, and through the power of the mind, we can create our own realities. From here on, uh, all the medieval and Renaissance traditions were rediscovered and reconceptualized to create a third way between Christianity and modern science. This third way, occultism, was itself broken up along numerous political lines, with right-wing thinkers taking up the traditionalism slash perennialism of René Guénon and Julius Evola, and 
the left wing, largely in England, taking up pagan slash Wiccan, magical, and theosophical ideas, ultimately culminating in such esoteric groups as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and Crowley's offshoot of it, the Ordo Templi Orientis, or Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophical Society. During the countercultural revolutions and social transformations of the 1960s, many of these various ideological groups and systems were brought together into countless idiosyncratic blends, even culminating in such psychedelic esotericism as espoused by Terence McKenna throughout the 1980s and 1990s. From this point onwards, esotericism ceases to be an object of historical research altogether and becomes a vital dimension of the very present, to use Honograph's words. In the chapters entitled Apologetics and Polemics, Honograph carefully outlines the process by which orthodoxies entrench themselves by a process of othering competing ideas through apologetics and polemics. These ideas, then, do not just exist in people's heads, but are concretized into social institutions with intergenerational lifespans. So churches, universities, political parties, etc. And these have a deep investment in maintaining their identities. Here, Honograph fleshes out his main idea with which he began the book. What constitutes Western esotericism is the sum total of knowledge rejected by both mainstream Protestantism and the scientific community. This constructive process could be said to have begun with the writings of the Church Fathers in their negotiations with pagan philosophy, especially Platonism, and then through the discourse of Platonic Orientalism, that is, Platonism understood as received knowledge from the East, the Church Fathers constructed the idea that Christianity was not new, but a revival of ancient and revealed truth. Honograph briefly covers the rebirth of this idea under Marsilio Ficino's Prisca Theologia and Pico della Mirandola's 900 Theses, with their millenarian implications during the Renaissance. Most importantly, he demonstrates the ambivalence of Platonic Orientalism from within a Roman Catholic context, since historically it had both revolutionary and conservative implications depending on the individual apologist or polemicist. Within less than half a century, however, the presence of Platonic theology in the learned circles of the Catholic Church became an object of vituperative attack by reformers who developed a genealogy of darkness, a kind of Platonic Orientalism in reverse, to demonstrate when exactly the church had gone astray, and how it could be restored, culminating in a discourse of anti-apologeticism. Jacob Tomasius, 1622-1684, for example, made the claim that because biblical revelation is absolutely true, it does not have a history. And because God's word is divine, it transcends human reason and cannot be subject to philosophical analysis. Rather, it is simply to be believed. To these men, the mother of all heresies was the belief in the eternity of the world. Emanations which posit souls or intelligences to be fragments of the divine, dualism, pantheism, and materialism were all vociferously rejected as pagan subversions of God's transcendence, each amounting to deification of creation at the expense of the creator. From here on, 
Syncretic Platonism was considered the arch-heresy and Trojan horse by which all of these subversive beliefs were brought into Christianity by none other than the Catholic Church Fathers of late antiquity. So this is how the line in the sand was established between orthodox and heterodox religion, a line which would ultimately come to define the outward circumference of what has today become known as Western esotericism. The book goes on to a series of general discussions on the themes of knowledge, practice, modernization, and between the disciplines, uh, devoting a full chapter to each, ultimately tying together ancient and modern perspectives with one coherent thread. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly for the sake of the perplexed, the book concludes with a detailed bibliography arranged by topic, including all of the most critical titles in each given subfield of Western esotericism. Having an expert like Honograph distill the vast body of available literature into an up-to-date and comprehensive reading list is invaluable in this day and age, uh, especially since the field is so saturated with impressionistic, misleading, and uncritical narratives that you often find populating the shelves of New Age bookstores. By and large, the books about esotericism destined for a popular audience are often products of so-called religionist sentiment rather than the scholarly approach guided by a principle of historicity. Most often, these books can themselves be seen and understood as modern expressions of Platonic Orientalism. In conclusion, I myself am most grateful for the effort extended by Honograph to reach a wider audience and to share in his radical historicist perspective on a subject that is usually so mired by ahistorical reconceptualizations and recapitulations. I hope this review was useful to you, and if you're interested in getting a copy of this particular little work, uh, you can see a link in the description.